um, for those of you who uh, are a little bit further away, like Mrs. Brogel, um, these are deer swimming, <laughs> if you can see that. So I never saw this in my life. This is an iPhone picture, like, yeah, quickly shot. And, and I just put this picture because it is something unusual that they do. They don't normally swim. And you would say they could have run around the lake because it wasn't a big lake. <laughs> but no, they enjoyed swimming. <laughs> so just keep that in mind while we go through the lecture. Great. The, I would like to talk about two a little bit contradicting trends that may also be linked. The one trend, we all know this, is the state of the world. And that is about drought, that's about water scarcity, that's about depleting natural resources, that's about conflict, that's about war, that's about migration that is causing difficulties in other countries, etc. So uh, this is the state of the world and quite interesting, there is an interesting image that most of you may be familiar with. These are the planetary boundaries developed by Johann Rockström and Stephanies and quite a number of other people from the Stockholm Resilience Center. And basically, um, just keep that image in mind because it is an image of danger. It is an image of warning. But interesting enough, if you look at it in a different way, it is also a pattern. Because what they clearly say is these um, transgression of the boundaries that we've done in climate change and biodiversity are interlinked. So if we don't stop this, then they might reinforce each other in what is often called a negative path dependency. So that leads to more and more vicious cycles of nature depletion, biodiversity depletion, depletion and an entire change of the, of the planetary system. So interesting enough, I found this there is a quite a similarity between this planetary boundaries and, and, and the, the call to action that we need to operate in, in what they call a safe operating space and the nuclear energy sign. So keep that in mind. There is a completely different visual, and I'm just emphasizing the visual because they transport something, and that's the visual you all know. These are the SDGs, and you can say this version is a little bit more for the more technical people, you know, there is tiles in a row, but interesting enough, the visual also conveys a little bit of fun because of the colors and, and the variety of colors and the icons, so quite interesting. For the first time, we do have global goals. We don't have just the millennium goals anymore that way for the development countries. We can't hardly remember or we can hardly think that we could dare to just develop goals for them and not for the entire world. We do have, and this is a real milestone in, in my view, we have goals that are applicable to the world's development. Whether everybody knows about these goals or not is a different question and whether they all are are, let's say, feasible to implement, whether they contradict each other, or some people even say, if we implement all of them, you know, the, the, the planet would collapse. We don't know yet, but the milestone is we have goals. And quite interesting, there is a 17th goal that kind of sneaked into there. There's not about the issue, that's not about content, but it's about how. And I would like to concentrate on the how today. And I would like to concentrate also on the other image the other visual that is around the goals, and that's the circle. So the, the tiles are more for the technical people, the circle are more for the systems thinker. <laughs> so and that's quite an interesting mix, and I think these people were genius when they developed the visual. Because what is now happening, that people can not link to the complexity of the goals. That is hardly impossible. Nobody can remember 17 goals, not even, and, and particularly not 169 targets, plus all the indicators. But what people can relate to is that orientation that is built around the visuals and, and around the shortcut. There's another narrative that is slowly growing. You might have heard about um, generative economy or well-being economy. So there is a shift in, in thinking that puts not just human beings center stage, but also what we have to do in order to take care of the planet. And interesting enough, also the Stockholm Resilience Center, they kind of turned around uh, created this what is called the wedding cake <laughs> and um, and said you know we're going to link the different SDGs yeah because we need to put some kind of order into this and there's quite an interesting image where it is clear 
that our economy <coughs> needs to be in service of our societies and our societies need to be in service of the biosphere. And only then this is going to work. So these are two different narratives which are quite, quite, quite interesting. And again, this is the how. How can we get there? As a matter of fact, sustainability transformations is the job of billions of actors. And I don't know how many conferences you have attended last year or the last couple of years, uh, how many workshops, how many papers you've read, how many joint papers, there are more, more authors on the paper, you've probably discovered that, that makes citations a little bit difficult. <coughs> there, there is a, a, a spread of we want to do things together and that is a growing tendency in the world, although we don't know how far we get and if we have reached enough numbers mm -hmm. in order to really make the shift. So the question is now, we need to accelerate sustainability transformations. We need to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs, although none of us, I don't know, maybe you, but not me, um, knows exactly what this means, sustainability transformation, or even sustainability, as it is a rather vague term. But anyway, we need to accelerate these transformations. We need to tra uh, accelerate the action, the collective action and the learning. And the question now that I asked myself also when I, when I um, worked, was working in the PhD was what do key decision makers need to do, and I'm emphas emphasizing this do, <laughs> to accelerate transformative collective behavior change for sustainability. And I came out with actually four points. You always have to kind of, a complex thing needs to be brought down into <laughs> a few bullet points. The first one is, I say, we need to integrate a systems view of aliveness. This is a slight variation. Some of you may need know the term a systems view of life. It's a book by Fritjof Capra. Read it. It's an absolutely great book. I say we need to integrate a systems view of aliveness into planning and implementing change. And that could guide us in a totally different direction, in a positive direction. I do think we need to integrate principles. We need to understand what gives life to systems. So that could be crucial and I've developed six principles. Other people may develop something else but I think we need to have more research in what are the principles that give life to systems. In order to accelerate sustain sustainability transformation we need transformative change designs and the rule applies. These transformative change designs need to model how we envisage the future. So it means we need to do today, even in little pockets, and operate with each other in a way we want the future systems to operate. And the fourth point is we need to steward transformative change collectively. That goes back to the 17th goal, saying, talking about partnerships, but it also brings in the term stewarding. Because one thing from my research is clear, we can't steer sustainability transformation. Even though if you try, by all means, it's not going to work. We can't control it. We can hardly coordinate it. And maybe it doesn't make sense to coordinate it. But it makes sense to slowly grow into a certain degree of coherence. So stewarding is a nice term because it means I take care of something that I can't entirely own. Still, I have to take care of it. So let's have a look at number one, how to integrate a systems view of aliveness into planning and implementing change. And just for a minute, I'm just going to ask you, any of the questions, just discuss it with your neighbor. Have you ever been walking into a building and thought, oh, this is a terrible building, or walked in a city and thought, oh, this is dead, like a shopping center uh, on a Sunday evening uh, in a parking lot or, yeah, like, or have you ever worked in a team and oh, you're talking and talking and you're not getting anywhere? Or have you ever worked in an initiative and you had the feeling you know, we reached, you had such good ideas, but we, we reached a dead end. Just chat with your neighbor just for half a minute, minute. <laughs> okay, I would like to get you out, get, get you out of this feeling of stuckness. But, but it is important that we can notice <coughs> that those interaction systems, kind of human interaction as well as architectural spaces or, or societal spaces where we have the feeling, <gasps> you know, this is depleting my aliveness. On the contrary, 
Have you ever walked into, this is the Sistine Chapel, ever walked in a place where you thought, oh, wow, this is uplifting, my energy, this is great. Or have you ever been walking or sitting in a place where you thought this view is really like nourishing my energy? Or have you ever been in a conversation with a loved one or with loved ones or with people you like where you thought this is really you know this is enticing this is invigorating you know this nourishes my energy or have you ever been part of an initiative where you thought wow you know I'm part of something really bigger and um, I'm working in this team I'm working in this organization and this is really we're getting somewhere this is we're gonna change the world and future is possible so that sense of aliveness I like you to hold because what I'm saying is this sentience that subjective feeling is at the core of how we need to organize sustainability transformation so I say aliveness needs to move into the central to the understanding to a new understanding of sustainability we need to move away from sustainability as compliance and we need to add to sustainability as technical implementation challenge as we have it now we need to move into do we understand what brings aliveness to systems and in order to do so we need to look at what are the patterns that actually what's the constellation of issues thoughts structures spaces etc that actually causes aliveness and for that I would like to just get a, a just make a little bit of a deep dive into systems theory and I'm only picking on certain people there are hundreds of other people who have been writing very very interesting things about how life works and that is of, of course a huge issue the interesting thing is I think these people need to be connected because I discovered the one doesn't read the stuff of the other <laughs> it's quite interesting so it is about connecting this so if we look at for example uh, Umberto Maturana and Francesco Varela then they have developed uh, the, the so-called Santiago theory of cognition where they basically say that cognition is the process of life so not just human beings but every living system every living being is able to cognize and this is what drives life quite interesting and somebody else like Stuart Kaufman probably all know Stuart Kaufman is sometimes says hands away from systems they are co-creative yeah. self-dynamic we can't change the, the system anyway we're part of it and yet at the same time we need to learn and understand how actually is our living systems co-creative if you jump to somebody else that's great Gregory Bateson Gregory Bateson looked at patterns in smaller systems and bigger systems and how they connect and what is absolutely both amazing as well as frightening that the whole digital revolution that we are in front of at the moment is working with patterns so if you find the adverts that match your last two weeks Google search this is all about pattern recognition when we talk about digital supporting medicine it's about pa pattern recognition when we talk about self-driving cars it's about pattern recognition the only thing I don't think the digital revolution at the moment has the patterns of aliveness really put center stage in terms of systems aliveness and individual aliveness but that is already taking place and most of us that we are in sustainability transformation don't really take note of what is happening there the other interesting person that I would like to mention is the the architect Christopher Alexander because he says that subjective feeling of a sense of aliveness that you probably could resonate with just now is something that has something in the background we can understand this and we should be able to co-create certain structures that then create aliveness in systems so I say from my research the urge for aliveness is what we share with nature it is not an end state to reach although we all try to be happy for the rest of our lives and it never quite works I don't know about you but <laughs> we
with me, it never quite works. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always like an up and down. It's not an end state, it is a process. And it, it's a transitory moment and it's a consolation. But we need to learn more about how this uh, consolation works. So life operates in patterns from small to large and the fern leaf and the chaos theory are just kind of um, examples of how life works in patterns. And they are everywhere, to the bad, to the good or to the bad, not necessarily all patterns of aliveness, but we also tend to talk about patterns when we say, yeah, there are negative patterns operating. So we need to take care of the patterns. And the degree of aliveness that also goes back to Christopher Alexander is, and that sounds very scientific, but it's very practical, a result of a pattern of mutually supportive <coughs> reinforcing properties, creating feedback loops in communication and interconnection. Have you, if you have ever worked in a brilliant team, that is what was happening. It was just fun and the, the results were good and it was not time consuming, it was like working. But as, as, as I said, there's never a, a final state of aliveness because um, that is always kind of going up and down, etc. So what I'm saying for sustainability transformation, we need to understand which patterns are creating a sense of aliveness in people, but also what are the conditions. Um, the resilience discourse makes a lot of contribution to that. What are the conditions for social systems, for aliveness in social <coughs> systems, and for aliveness in natural systems. And the entire resilience discourse, including also, also the, the discourse on eco-services, et cetera, is actually building an understanding of what are aliveness, what are alive systems. So that is important because resilience is a way, when there is vitality and aliveness, the system is usually resilient and better able to respond to di disturbances. And that's why it is so crucially important. So in the area of the Anthropocene, um, that can be defined as an era where the human impact on Earth is so enormous that we actually are about to change the conditions for life to occur. So that is a huge, very, very important step in the development of the world, but also in the development of humankind, because we finally have to become conscious about our consciousness, about the planet and the system that we're operating in. And that has been a long development, I think that started with quantum physics and the Gaia theory and a lot of other things, but it is now time and I always feel like something is shifting now. It is really about becoming, becoming um, conscious about our consciousness. But we can also destroy and endanger and compromise aliveness. At the same time, there is the human ability to perceive aliveness, and that could become a guiding force. Because as Christopher Alexander say, says, in buildings, we can create buildings that have a constellation, that create a sense of aliveness in people, and so we can maybe construct systems and processes they also create aliveness and resilience in systems. And I think much more research has to go into understanding this and seeing what it means. What I've done in the, in the research that I've done, I've drawn from all the different scientists and academic working, uh, both contemporary and, and people who have been working or publishing mainly in the, in the last, 10 years of the last century. Now it is already last century. <laughs> it sounds like long back, but it isn't really long back. <laughs> and I've developed six systemic principles that in my view give life to systems individually in our orga organizations and in our societies. And the principle one is intentional generativity. Now this is quite daring. It means life is purposeful. Life is intentional. That would be, in terms of how we view the world, quite a revolution. But there are more and more people who say, life wants to grow more life. And the purpose of life is to stay alive and create more life. For human interaction systems, this means when we go about transformative change, we need to tap into the sense of possibilities, into future orientation. We need to actually look at how we empower people. And we need to actually bring this into a 
process that we all know that is a process of planning and more monitoring where we can mix the, the, the inspiration and the empowerment with deliberate steps how to move forward. There are quite a lot of examples from organizational change and social change. And I just want to hint to one method that you may know that is appreciative inquiry. That's an interesting uh, future planning method that builds on what is already alive in a system. So that is a reminder of, of uh, appreciative inqui inquiry. Regarding large systems change, it's quite interesting. If we really, if it's really about changing a um, an econ world economic system or changing the the the, the, the natural resource use of a certain region, then the, the, the big question is how can we move towards narratives that are enlivening? So where people take up energy and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm with us, I'm bringing in my ideas, I, I will move towards it. The principle number two um, is important because if we only drive the expanding energy, <laughs> We're not going to get anywhere. Containment is extremely important. What is important here is that the containment is permeable. We all know what it means if, we if it comes to human systems, if people live in close communities. Uh, you know, we can, we can predict, you know, that there are conflicts with other communities. So in life, there's always, if you look at the body, if you look at natural systems, there are always kind of some boundaries about something, but they're also <coughs> permeable. So that is important that we need to kind of model this in the way we um, push forward transformative change. So we need to look at processes and, and at the quality of process, who talks with who, who builds, who, how do we build a collaboration system that is a step-by-step -step system so that more and more people can work together how do we leverage connectivity and um, how do we actually focus on tangible results and collective action because that is what brings, you know, what, what creates identity of people. In organizational social change, it is about a step-by-step -step engagement process and in large systems change, we need to look at what are enabling structures. If you look at our institutional structures or our societal structures, I mean, you can ask which of them are offering a good containment, are they permeable or not? And which of them are actually deteriorating aliveness because don't people, fe people don't uh, feel alive in these systems. The third principle is about novelty. And that is very important because life always invents something new. So they're always kind of different pathways. So in transformative change, we need to look at how we invigorate the human capability to actually invent new pathways and walk into the unknown. And that is about creating spaces for creativity. That is also fostering excellence. Yes, there can be a little bit competition. We can be better or, you know, not just good results, but excellent results. But it's also fostering a, a certain degree of agility, the ability to, to learn fast and to turn crisis into opportunities. In organizational change, you probably have noticed that there was a huge wave of design thinking in the last five, ten years. So, uh, in, in innovation labs, so that, that's coming up. I'm, I'm just saying this is not the only pathway that we need to pursue. We don't need to think that this is the only thing we need, uh, but that is quite interesting. And in large systems change, and there's more and more happening, the question is how can governments, how can companies actually incentivize sustainability-oriented innovation over just innovation. Principle number four is contextual interconnectedness that relates very closely to primary containment because we do have systems and there are multiple systems that are part of bigger systems that are again multiple systems, etc., etc., etc. For human interaction systems, that means <coughs> that our ability to a dialogue, to communicate, and to create feedback loops of understanding and reflecting reflection are increasingly important for sustainability transformation. So this means in process, we need to look at the dialogic quality of processes. We need to look at the diversity of perspectives and we need to create structures and systems for iterative learning. In social change, there were quite a lot of, um, I think 
yeah, open space, World Cafe, uh, whole systems change, future search conferences. There are lots of methodology that I have developed around helping people to communicate and dialogue in a different way. And in large systems change, it is slightly different. We need to look at not just one government, but we need to look at governance systems at different levels. So we need to look at multi-issue, multi-stakeholder, multi-level governance issues because that can accelerate learning. Principle number five is all around wholeness. And you remember a team that feels whole and alive, they are supporting each other. And that very often occurs when people engage with a larger picture. That is also why the visual of the SDGs is so extremely important because it is an engagement with a big, big vision that I have no clue how to connect with, but I couldn't connect with the visual. And then I'm connected. So that is why, why this is emotionally so important. That in transformative change designs, we need to look at not just our silo initiative, but kind of have a proper context analysis and an ongoing context analysis. We all know this, but I'm, I mean it kind of really, really looking at what other people are doing. It is about creating an atmosphere of mutual support because that is contagious. That is what people um, jump on. And we need to access people's willingness to contribute to a larger story. In organizational change, we have a newly coming up, Peter Sanger, Kanya, I don't know if you're familiar with collective impact, but the systems leadership that is coming up or systems entrepreneurship. So where it's clearly referring to the whole system and we have a lot of methodologies that have been developed around this. For large systems change, interesting enough, it has a slightly different connotation because we need to look at wholeness from the issue of guiding. So when we think about sustainability transformation, some people do this. This is mainly an issue of regulations and resource allocations. We need to, to invest in this and not in this. And we need to create regulations from top to bottom, including I'm living in a in the countryside and um, everybody is, um, am I supposed to fell a tree or not? And, and what is the size of the tree that I can fell or when do I need to ask? This is the level of, you know, where it needs to be brought down, sustainability <laughs> transformation uh, in terms of regulations. So this is um, a very important point. And the last point, the last principle is referring back to the issue of consciousness and acknowledging that consciousness is something that exists everywhere in the world. Every living being has consciousness, not just human beings. But we are lucky enough to be able to be become conscious about our consciousness. Uh, so this is also our responsibility in the Anthropocene. <coughs> so we need to actually foster um, humankind's ability to reflect while acting. And that means really essentially going back to our humanity and to developing our mindfulness developing a sense of balance between differences and looking how things look from another perspective and be able to, to look at, at reconciliation processes, et cetera. That can be collective reflection, peer review, feedback system, and quite interesting for large systems change, this is about metrics. And you would probably not expect metrics alongside humanity and alongside reflective consciousness because it feels like touchy-feely when we talk about humanity. But no, the only reason for metrics is that they help us become more aware of the situation. Otherwise, we don't need metrics. And if our metrics are not sustainability-oriented, like, for example, the GDP, it doesn't help us in raising consciousness for what is important regarding sustainability. So that is. The number three that decision makers can actually do <coughs> is develop innovative, holistic, transformative change designs. And in the research, I've developed a conceptual architecture that brings the principles together with design principles and with what are called transformation enablers, things that we can actually do for large systems change. And for example, we need to ask what is it that people, it invigorates people to shape the future? Who needs to be part of a collaboration initiative? 
What are the really new ideas and which already exist that we need to foster? What actually reaches people hearts, people's hearts and minds? And what, what's the way we can leverage diversity? And how can we relate to a bigger picture in our initiatives? These are some of the questions. And you can ask many, many other questions around these, these, um, these conceptual architecture, the different principles. If we do this, and if we do it together, and that is the crucial issue, and not kind of single out one, then we are quite likely to induce a sense of aliveness or to bring a sense of aliveness out that is already in the system that can become quite technical. These are three examples that uh, my colleagues from the Collective Leadership Institute know. <laughs> because we live in a technical world, we live in a linear world, so we need to translate this, and this is one of the biggest tasks to translate a systemic approach and a, a life-focused approach into the linear approach. But if you look at it, it's quite colorful, number one. <laughs> it's quite confusing, number two. <laughs> it, needs, it looks terribly complex. But interesting enough, it helps people. Because they see, ah, we're doing something on the macro and meso level. And we get this group into a collaboration system. And then parallel, we work with the micro level and get them into a collaboration system. And while we do this, we bring them together at a certain stage in order to create a bigger collaboration system that then can move this is about Egyptian vocational training. And there are two other examples. This is about a huge water crisis in a province in Tunisia. Elizabeth is quite familiar with that. <laughs> uh, where it is about um, first working for a long time with farmers because and, and, and bringing humanity in and actually bringing a, a sense of, of future possibilities in because and, and we can't bring that in, you know. It, it was like listening to people in a way that they would develop a sense of aliveness, and that needed to be parallel to the process with the government. That couldn't be connected in the beginning because people would not speak with each other because they were throwing stones at e each other. So that was, was a very conflictual process. And then over time, by integrating the, integrating the different principles, bringing the system together, and in, in Tunisia, that was quite emotional because people actually got together in a, in a um, 80 people, you know, with a minister of water present and, and um, quite four minutes. Okay. <laughs> so it was quite an emotional event because for the first time they had the feeling we can shape our water future together. We have been fighting like no tomorrow. And now we can shape it together. And there were tangible outcomes, you know, like what to do, you know, uh, about irrigation and about uh, boreholes and about wells, etc. So the issue now is, and that's number four, it is about stewarding transformative change collectively. Collectively, so we have to go beyond the transformative process design for a certain initiative, and we have to look at what is the transformation system. And at the moment, we have a situation where we have typically a lot of fragmented initiatives in sustainability, also around the SDGs. We have more and more, because of maybe the goal number 17, multi-stakeholder partnerships, that is a good move, that is very, very important, because they create a different way of people working together. So we have more and more uh, initiatives to address complex issues in multi-stakeholder collaboration, but I say this is not enough. We need to actually tr have transformative designs. We need to have complementary action <coughs> by networks of change agents, and we need to look at who are we in a transformation system. That could be a region, that could be a country, that could be an organization, that could be a, a global issue, but we need to feel we are part of a transformation system. We can't steer it, we can't control it, but we can steer it together in a way that the outcome is more alive for people. So that is why the transformation enablers are important. It is about narratives that are alivening. It is about building empowering structures and asking what are really empowering structures and in what way do we have to transform our structures. It is about fostering sustainability innovation and it is about looking at what measures, how, what do we measure because the rule applies what gets measured gets improved. If you measure the wrong thing, the wrong thing gets improved, which we have at the moment. And we have forms of, we need to look at what are the forms of govern governance that we actually need in terms of multi-level, multi-issue. 
And we need to look at what are the voluntary and the binding re regulations and what is our system of shifting resource allocations in the right direction, because these structures have an impact on how we operate together. So in that way, I say we need transformative, transformative process design. <laughs> these are interventions. And we need transformative systems designed. These are actually multiple interventions that have transformative process designs. And the result is that we bring aliveness into systems, because if that is the case, or if we don't bring it in, that we create the space for it to emerge, that's probably the better expression. Then we have what we need to accelerate sustainability transformation. We have self-dynamic reinforcing processes and a lot of self-organization. And that is the only thing that can really accelerate sustainability transformation. Thank you.